Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Um, so my research is uh, centered on a time series. I'm fascinated by time series. What is a time series? If you have a, if you focus on a certain variable, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm especially interested in physiology and medicine. So I'm focusing on, on uh, physiological variables, but it may be variables from climate, from ecology, from uh, whatever. So if you, if you follow, if you focus on a certain variable and you follow its behavior in time, you get a time series, you get something which, fluctu which fluctuates. And so the idea is that these fluctuations, the statistics, tells us something about the regulatory processes which are underlying the process. And so in physiology, we want to understand or we want to use these time series to understand what is happening in the human body and uh, to have some objective, hopefully, measure of, uh, of health. Um, I guess that uh, my colleague uh, Anna Leonor Rivera, the first day, must have told you about some studies that she did in the human body on uh, blood pressure and heart rate. And so something peculiar that she found was that, uh, so you see that most of these time series are very variable. For example, she found that uh, heart rate variability, the more variable the heart rate is, the better, a better indication of health. But in blood pressure, it's the opposite. The more variable blood pressure, the worse the perspective for health. And so I, I wanted to understand those things. So I guess that uh, uh, these time series can tell us something about the resilience and the homeostasis of, uh, of the human body. Um, so in the first slide, I showed you time series of different variables, uh, the count of uh, 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 white blood cells, uh, heart rate, uh, uh, the, the length of the different steps we take when we, when we walk, uh, blood pressure, uh, small oscillations of our, our fingers, for example, and they all oscillate in different ways. The statistics, uh, for example, in this case uh, of white blood cells is uh, more periodic. Here it's more variable, more stochastic, for example. So my question is, in order to understand heart rate or heart rate of variability, do you need to be a cardiologist? And in order to, to understand human gait, how we walk, do you need to be a, a physiotherapist? And in order to, to understand brain signals, do you need to be a neurologist? Or, so that this would be a reductionist perspective, whereas from the complexity sciences, we would be looking for perhaps general underlying principles that may explain, hopefully, the statistics of all of these time series. So hopefully, this complex behavior of these uh, physiological time series, perhaps we can explain them with simple underlying rules, which apply to all of these uh, different variables, heart rate, blood pressure. That's, that's my focus. I, want to, I, I, I would be very interested to find these simple rules. And uh, the purpose of, uh, of, of this investigation is, is more general than just physiology. I think it has to do with the resilience of, uh, of complex dynamical systems. So we are very worried about uh, climate change, about um, financial crashes, or, uh, extinction of uh, species all over the world. And so we would like to predict and hopefully prevent the collapse of these complex dynamical systems. So we would like to, to, to find a way to define and hopefully to quantify the resilience of these uh, systems. And so hopefully uh, when the system is degenerating, hopefully we see this reflected in this measure of resilience. And so hopefully we can prevent or predict and prevent the collapse of the system. And so apparently two key uh, aspects of resilience appear to be robustness the ability to resist perturbations from the environment and also to adapt to, to perturbations. So uh, uh, physiology, according to me, is just one specific example of a complex system. And um, so this, this field of physiology has been around for uh, many, many, many years. Uh, it starts with Claude Bernard, a French physiologist, and uh, Walter Cannon, uh, uh, an American, Jewish American physiologist. And Claude Bernard suggested that the stability of the internal environment is uh, the necessary requ requirement for a free and independent life. What does that mean? Well, uh, we humans have a constant body temperature. Uh, unlike reptiles. So reptiles, for example, are only active during the day when it's warm outside and become very passive and, and, and not very active during the night. Whereas we humans, when we have to prepare a talk for the next day, for example, we can stay up the whole night and, and prepare a talk. So the stability of our internal environment, certain key vital 
keep parameters, we, we are able to keep constant inside our body. And so this makes us uh, free and independent from the uh, outside circumstances. And uh, so although Claude Bernard was one of the most successful physiologists of his lifetime, his idea of the stable internal environment was not very successful during his lifetime, most probably because the technology necessary to confirm his statement uh, so the, 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 the technology to measure these internal parameters was not around. And so only afterwards, well, his idea became accepted. And then uh, Walter Cannon, 50 years later, built, oh, it's quite a complicated device. Um, so Walter Cannon uh, built on the ideas of Claude Bernard, and he said that uh, one of the ways in which the human body is able to maintain the stability of this internal environment is by uh, 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 adaptive responses to perturbations from the uh, uh, outer environment. And so he, he coined the word uh, homeostasis. So homeostasis implies two key uh, uh, aspects of ideas, adaptability and stability. So uh, now nowadays we do have uh, all of this technology to, to verify, not only to verify that this internal environment indeed stays constant, indeed is stable, but we use it in order to uh, perform clinical diagnosis. So uh, if you do whatever blood test, you will get this table with many difficult names and many numbers. And so what people look for is that uh, these point measurements of uh, chemical ingredients in the blood or whatever, that they are uh, maintained, let's say, within a, a very narrow homeostatic range, uh, which has been defined by uh, population uh, studies. And so if all of your uh, parameters are within this narrow range, well, you're defined as being healthy. If your parameters are outside of this range, well, you have some, some problems. Um, but, um, well, if, if your parameters are outside of this range, you are already ill. And I would be very interested to see, uh, so these parameters are the end result of the regulatory processes. It's something static, it's static measures. And I would be more interested in seeing uh, the dynamics of the regula regulatory process itself. And so uh, we would need uh, uh, some insight in these, in the dynamics of these uh, regulatory uh, processes in order to do uh, prognosis and uh, uh, preventive medicine. So uh, medical specialists, when they try to uh, predict uh, negative health outcomes, they focus on um, uh, symptoms. But these symptoms come from um, problems in the regulatory processes. And so if we could uh, have some insight or measure these regulatory processes, hopefully we, we would be be one step ahead and uh, could predict uh, or uh, follow the generative processes of a disease or aging uh, more into uh, detail. So that's that's the idea. So I uh, I would like to use um, time series of physiological parameters to have some insight in stability of uh, of uh, the human body for example the the, the egyptian uh, pyramids are very resistant to perto outside perturbations but you could uh, imagine if there would be uh, a perturbation strong enough to topple the pyramids well they would not be able to put themselves upright uh, by themselves so another key aspect is uh, adaptability so if you have a stimulus which is so strong well perhaps in uh, the best way to deal with the stimulus would not be to resist but to adapt as uh, trees do when there's a, a dominant wind, for example. So uh, uh, two aspects I would uh, like to uh, focus on. Uh, how does the, the human body respond when there's a, a single dominant stimulus, which can be repetitive or can be continuous, and when there's a variety of stimuli with different amplitudes and uh, durations? What are the different um, uh, strategies that the human body uh, follows in order to uh, deal with these uh, stimuli. And so uh, the key idea is the following. So uh, Claude Bernard uh, proposed this concept of a, a, a stable internal environment. Um, his idea was not very successful during his lifetime because the people lacked the necessary technology in order to confirm that hypothesis. 
Uh, nowadays, we do know that a stable internal environment is very important. We use it to do uh, uh, diagnosis. But additionally, now we have um, um, new technologies, even uh, from the consumer market, smartwatches, smartphones, which are collecting continuously the whole day long uh, vital data. So we, uh, it's, it has become very uh, easy to um, construct databases with a physiological time series. So uh, I would be interested to, to, to see how these time series reflect the dynamics of a physiological regulation. So that's the, the topic of my talk. That was, that was the intro, introduction. Let me go to the first part of my talk. What happens with the human body when we have a single dominant stimulus? So for example, let's say you, you're running on, a, how do you call this, a treadmill. Um, so this is a, a time, these are three simultaneous time series uh, measured with a, 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 a nice apparatus. It's a, it's a belt that you put on the, on the chest and it collects uh, simultaneously the acceleration, how fast you're moving, heart rate, breathing dynamics, etc. So for example, here we have a time series of uh, uh, 30 minutes, uh, no, let's say, uh, the grid lines are at five minutes uh, intervals. So I think it's a time series of about uh, one hour, two hours, uh, half an hour uh, uh, running. Uh, here the subject is in, in rest, uh, walking in the house, lying supine, walking in the house. Here he starts to run and then uh, resting, uh, sitting down, walking in the house, lying down, etc. So how does the body respond? Uh, you see some very distinct features in, in the heart rate. So when the subject is in rest or doing low intensity exercise, uh, low uh, intensity well, walking in the house, let's say, or, or lying down, the heart rate is very variable. So it's not constant, heart rate is not constant. Uh, Alejandro Frank likes to say that the, the heart is not a Swiss clock, perhaps it's a Mexican clock. So it's not, it's not beating, it's not, sorry for the joke. Um, it's not beating with a, with a, with a constant rhythm, it's, it's fluctuating all the time. And uh, likewise for the breathing rate, the breathing rate is also not constant, so you're breathing more rapidly. Uh, perhaps I should explain the, the unit's breathing rate is in cycles per minute and heart rate is in beats per minute. So uh, in rest or low intensity activities, uh, physiological variables are not constant, are highly variable. But what happens when we're doing exercise? Well, uh, Alejandro, this might be a surprise. The heart becomes a Swiss, Swiss clock. Why? Because, well, we're focused on one single task. So uh, perhaps if, if you're just walking, you think about uh, some paper that you want to write or so, uh, something like that. But if you're at the highest speed, well, you cannot think of anything else. You're just, your whole body is focused just on this single task of, of uh, running. Whereas when we're in rest, okay. But also, is it the, the, the activity is more constant when you're running? So, in other words, uh, you know, I think an important point there is like when you're sitting down, you're fidgeting. You know, there's a, there's a lot more variability in actually the movements themselves than actually when you're just constantly uh, running. That's much more metronomic, right? Okay, it's a nice point. Um, but my explanation would rather be that when you're in rest or doing low intensity activities, you're actually multitasking. So you're thinking, you're digesting, you're fidgeting, you're, you're doing different things. And so when you're multitasking, well, uh, heart rate and physiological parameters have to adapt to a variety of different stimuli. And so you need to be variable. You need to delegate uh, some of your uh, blood flow to some activity and afterwards to another activity. So I think this is this vari variability is a signature of multitasking. Whereas uh, physiological parameters, when you're focused on a single task, well, they become very, well, they become Swiss clocks. Uh, yes, yes, yes. So this was my uh, first example of a single dominant stimulus, which is continuous. What happens if we have, oh, yeah. So uh, large variability when we're in rest, uh, minimal variability when we're focused on a, one single task. And then after exercise, when we're uh, recuperating, uh, not only this acceleration, but we, 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 we start to decelerate our heart rhythm, decelerate breathing 
uh, rate, but also variability starts increasing, starts recovering uh, again. So you're recovering from this uh, uh, single difficult task and you start to do slowly uh, multitasking again. That would be my, my interpretation. So this is one single stimulus, which is continuous. What happens if we have a single dominant stimulus, which is repetitive? One of the best examples of this is uh, what happens uh, with our body with the day-night alteration. So we have, again, here uh, different physiological variables. Uh, uh, it's, this time it's not uh, acceleration, it's actigraphy. Actigraphy is the number of movements you make per minute. And now the grid lines are at uh, 24 hours, they are at midnight. Uh, and so, uh, obviously, we're more active, well, most of us, during the day, and less active during the night, and then again active the next day, and again uh, less active uh, uh, during the night. And uh, simultaneously, I have, I show here uh, four other variables. Uh, red is heart rate, orange is blood pressure, uh, purple is uh, internal core temperature, and blue is skin temperature. And so what do we see? That uh, the, 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 the most dominant feature of all of these time series is this periodic day and night cycle, the response to the day and night cycle. And you, you call this a, a circadian rhythm. And so the easiest way to, to measure or quantify uh, circadian rhythms is uh, fitting a function, for example, a sine function. This method is, is called the, the cosinor method. And um, so uh, if you fit this cosine function, then you have the, uh, the average of the mesor, you have the period, you have the amplitude, you have the, the, the time of the most activity, and you have the, the goodness of fit parameter. And so uh, curiously, what you obtain is that blood pressure and core temperature have the best fit, have the best uh, periodic fit, have the strongest circadian rhythm or the least fluctuations. And so this will be important in the, in the, in the second part of my talk, uh, these fluctuations. Um, you can do a uh, Fourier analysis, and uh, what do you see? You see a dominant peak at uh, uh, seven oscillations per week, sorry, seven os oscillations per week, that's the, the circadian rhythm. And perhaps it's a little bit difficult to see, but the peak is uh, strongest for core temperature and for blood pressure, and a little bit less uh, dominant for heart rate and skin temperature. And something else that you see, which is interesting, oh, yeah, so this is a Fourier analysis, linear scale. This is a Fourier analysis uh, log log scale. You have this uh, more or less a power law uh, tail. And uh, this, what, what I call a spree diagram or zip plot, is nothing less than the, 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 the power spectrum in log log scale. But now, instead of uh, having uh, the coordinates being frequencies, here are ordered all of the components from the strongest one this is the, the largest scale to the least dominant one, the smallest scales. And what you see is that in blood pressure and in uh, core temperature, fluctuations are suppressed. So the, the large scale components are augmented. Here are some legends. The large scale features are uh, enhanced in blood pressure and in core temperature, and the fluctuations are suppressed. And this has some meaning. Uh, I will explain this in the second part of my talk. So uh, the conclusion of this first part where I dealt with a, a single dominant stimulus is that um, uh, the body should respond to the stimulus because it's more easy to, to adapt to the single dominant stimulus than to try to uh, resist. And so uh, what happens with aging or a disease, uh, uh, here you see uh, an elderly adult uh, which is healthy and you see that he's uh, very active during the day, not active during the night, active during the next day. And with frailty, when the person gets ill or another person gets ill, well, this day and night rhythm is slowly uh, lost. So this adaptability to this single dominant stimulus is lost. Also, uh, clinicians, for example, use uh, stress testing. So you have a person lying down, you make him stand up, and you would expect um, uh, a normative response of all of your physiological parameters. And if the response is too low, or uh, too high, well, it may be an indication of, of illness. Okay, let me go to the second part of my talk. What happens if uh, the body needs to respond to a variety of stimuli? Uh, do you remember these time series I showed you here? Um, so, uh, actigraphy, one week uh, time series, uh, blood pressure, heart rate, core temperature, skin temperature. 
What I did was study the fluctuations of these time series as a, a percentage of the mean around the mean of all of these uh, variables. So if I do that, I get dimensionless uh, fluctuations expressed as a percentage of the respective mean, and so I get some distributions uh, for actigraphy, for blood pressure, heart rate, shown here, for core temperature, skin temperature, shown here, and here they are shown all together. And so what I'm um, impressed about is uh, the difference of shape between blood pressure and heart rate on the one hand, and uh, between uh, core temperature and skin temperature on the other hand. So what do I see? Blood pressure is like a superposition of two Gaussians. No? Why two Gaussians? Well, uh, what is a Gaussian? Well, small oscillations around a set point. Uh, a set point during the night, a set point during the day. So you have two different set points. All oscillations around, well, the daytime set point, around nighttime set point. So this... Uh, this reflects that uh, blood pressure uh, wants to be maintained within a very narrow range around the set point. And heart rate, it's not so simple. It's like a, a long-tailed distribution. You cannot explain it with just small fluctuations around the set point. Its function is uh, different. It wants to adapt to stimuli from the outside world, absorb these fluctuations, these perturbations. Why? with the objective to maintain as constant as possible blood pressure. And the same thing is valid also for core temperature. So temperature, again, uh, you, can, you can explain it as uh, small fluctuations around two set points, a day set point, a night set point, whereas skin temperature is not so simple. It's again a long-tailed distribution. Why? Because you want to absorb the perturbations from the outside environment with the objective to maintain as stable as possible uh, core temperature. Uh, perhaps I should explain a little bit uh, more about skin temperature. What is skin temperature? Well, it has to do with vasoconstriction, vasodilatation. So when it's cold outside, uh, you, 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 you will not fill the capillaries just below the skin with blood. You will divert all the blood to the big arteries in order to suppress the amount of heat that you would radiate to the outside environment. And so skin temperature goes down because you have vasoconstriction. When it's warm outside, the opposite. You have vasodilatation, so all the blood from these big arteries, you divert them to the capillaries just below the skin in order to radiate as much, as much heat as possible to the outside environment, and so skin temperature goes up. And so this is why skin temperature is so variable. Uh, well, okay. Um, so this is an example in optimal conditions of youth and health. So... Um, the, the difference in statistics between blood pressure and heart rate reflects the very different functions, the very different functions these variables play in the underlying homeostatic reg regulatory mechanisms. So in optimal conditions of youth and health, when all of these regulatory processes work well, you would expect to find big differences in the statistics of these variables that play different functions. So what will happen with aging and disease when these regulatory processes degenerate? Well, I would expect the difference between the difference in statistics between these two different variables to disappear or perhaps even to reverse, to invert. And so this is exactly uh, what we see here. This is a reinterpretation of the data of uh, Anna Leonor in her uh, population of uh, diabetic patients and healthy controls, where uh, they measured in healthy controls in recently diagnosed diabetic patients and in long-standing diabetic patients two variables, heart rate and blood pressure. Uh, red, again, is uh, heart rate. Uh, this is blood pressure, or the orange curve. You can, can clearly see that with uh, the advance of the disease from recently diagnosed diabetes to long-standing diabetic patients, that uh, the variability of heart rate is increasingly lost. So here, for example, heart rate variability all, almost has disappeared. And then when I do the same trick with uh, these um, probability curves of fluctuations around the, the average expressed as a percentage of the average, what do I see? Well, uh, blood pressure is uh, corresponds, this is a semi-logarithmic plot, yes. Uh, so uh, this parabola represents a Gaussian. Um, uh, blood pressure uh, variability is contained within this uh, Gaussian distribution. 
whereas heart rate has this uh, long tail toward heart rate accelerations. And probably this variability of heart rate is used in order to absorb the perturbations from the outside environment with the objective to uh, maintain blood pressure uh, within uh, a certain amount of fluctuations around the set point. What do we see with um, uh, uh, the start of diabetes? Well, heart rate variability is lost. And whereas in the healthy controls, blood pressure variability was maintained within these distributions, here we see a small tail of uh, hypotensive uh, episodes, which is starting in these diabetic patients, most probably because uh, heart rate variability is not enough to stabilize the internal environment. And what happens with long-standing uh, diabetes? Well, heart rate variability is lost completely, and so uh, blood pressure gets out of control. So, uh, and then if you, if you check the literature, then uh, indeed you can find some um, 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 evidence for this difference between different types of variables in, in complex systems, at least in, in, in physiology. For example, you can find these tables in, in physiology where they speak about regulated variables. So these are the variables that uh, are to be maintained constant, blood pressure, core temperature, uh, oxygen, oxygenation of the blood, blood glucose. And so how does the blood, uh, so how does the body maintain constant all of these variables? Well, using other types of variables, effector variables, heart rate, stroke volume, blood volume, vasomotor, vasoconstriction, vasodilatation, etc., in order to observe the perturbations from the outside environment with the objective to maintain as constant as possible the, the, the variables of this uh, first column. And also in control theory, well, you can find these uh, feedback loops where you have a regulated variable that you want to control. You have a sensor which measure, measures the, the value of this variable. And if it deviates from a, a certain set point, well, you have to change uh, your uh, effector variables. You have a physiological response. And uh, well, you, you correct uh, uh, your regulated variable. So if I, let me skip this. I think I don't have any time out, okay. So let me finish, conclusions. Uh, so I put this all in this uh, one table. Um, so you have different types of stimuli, dominant stimulus versus a variety of stimuli. And you have different types of variables, regulated versus effector. In the case of a dominant stimulus, you want all of your physiological variables to do the same thing. You want them to adapt to the perturbation and you want this uh, uh, response to be normative. If you have a non-normative response, which is too strong, too weak, well, the adaptability is not good. And so clinicians use uh, this non-normative response in order to uh, quantify uh, certain diseases. In the case of a variety of stimuli, well, you cannot adapt your whole body to changing circumstances every second. You would uh, waste all of your body energy. So how does the body deal with a variety of different stimuli? Well, you have certain vital parameters that you maintain constant, and there are others who do the uh, adaptive responses. So in optimal conditions of youth and health, you would expect regulated variables to be motion statistics, small fluctuations around the set point, and then with uh, adverse conditions of uh, uh, aging or disease, uh, an increase of uh, fluctuations, an increase of variability, blah, 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 blah. And your effective variables uh, in healthy conditions should be, well, adaptive, fractal physiology, perhaps self-organized criticality. And then uh, with adverse conditions, what will you see? Well, a loss of, uh, of complexity. So uh, in conclusion, partially some of these results were already known. So people speak about early warning signals, speak, people speak about loss of complexity, people speak about uh, self-organized criticality, but uh, it's all only parts of the puzzle. And I think this is a, perhaps a step towards a more a complex or global view of uh, this very rich phenomenology of, uh, of uh, physiological uh, variables. Thank you very much for your attention.